Hello everyone. Today we are going to continue with the talk on recurrent implantation failure. And as we are discussing the very recent European guidelines on when we can say it is recurrent implantation failure and uh, what all tests are recommended and what all interventions are recommended. These are based on huge data which a group of people have categorized into levels of evidence. Of course, each doctor, each center has their own clinical practice, uh, which I shall discuss uh, during the course of the talk. So in the last uh, time, we said that depending on the age, there are predictors of what is considered recurrent failure. It could be two, three, or four embryo transfer depending on your age. And till you have reached that 60% cutoff mark for pregnancy, so, you know, succumbing to repeated investigations therapy may not be a wise decision, though the anxiety levels are understandably very high. Now, continuing... So once we have come into this more than 60% criteria, we will now see what are the investigations. Some are recommended, some are mildly recommended and some are not recommended. So what are the ones that are uh, recommended? Lifestyle, endometrial thickness and antiphospholipid antibody and antiphospholipid syndrome. So let's look into this. One minute, we will. So lifestyle uh, interventions have known to improve the results. So if you are on, if you are overweight or grossly underweight, drugs, alcohol, your diet is not good, you're smoking, you're taking too much coffee, you're not exercising, then this will lead to repeated failure and please correct it on an urgent basis. Then endometrium thickness. The thicker the endometrium up to 9 or 10 mm, the better are our results. Of course, even in 5 millimeter, people have got results. We've got one or two pregnancies. But you, it is best more than 8. 6, 7, we can go ahead. So we have to try to make the endometrium as thick and uh, triple layer trilaminar as possible. Thrombophilia. Now, this is a condition which leads to increase in clotting. And earlier when uh, there were high risk factors like history of thrombosis in your young age or leg vein deep vein thrombosis or thrombosis after surgery, family history of surgery, grossly overweight, then, you know, APA, APS would, these tests would be done. But now the recommendation is even if there is no such history, but your IVF is not becoming successful, then you must get antiphospholipid antibody and antiphospholipid uh, syndrome ruled out. So what are the things that can be recommended when you are failing again and again in IVF? Uh, karyotyping of both the partners, 3D ultrasound, hysteroscopy, endometrial function testing, chronic endometritis testing, thyroid and progesterone. So let's get into these. These are not strong recommendation, but these are still recommendation. So sometimes husband or wife may be completely normal, but there are minor changes in the uh, chromosome structure of the male or the female, usually what we call translocation, Robertsonian, and these can lead to 
uh, the person will be normal leading a proper life but the embryo that is formed will be defective and will lead to repeated uh, failures implantation failure and in such cases genetic testing of the embryo pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy pgta is recommended then you should do a hysteroscopy sometimes your 2d ultrasound will miss out small polyps uh, small septum uh, a 3d can also pick it up so definitely uh, you know in these cases hysteroscopy will be useful uh, you can also clean the cavity you can irritate the cavity the tubes get flushed at the same time you can send the tissue for histopathology and pcr and it's best done just before the period start though nowadays uh, you know to reduce anesthesia time and also because uh, patient time duration is not so much there a lot of frozen cycles are being done so hysteroscopy is sometimes being combined even with ovum pickup then in the cavity if you see intramural fibroids now as we all know fibroids are of three kinds one is inside the cavity one is outside the uterine wall and one is in the wall intramural and mostly people have said that you know forget the intramural if it's not indenting the cavity but a lot of data, if you see on this side, these are scientific papers that have said that, you know, non-cavity distorting uh, intramural fibroids, if you don't take it out in RIF, you are just reducing your pregnancy rates. I've had so many women who've come to me with repeated failures from all over the world and I've seen a big fibroid, four centimeter fibroid, sitting in the cavity and the gynecologist refused to take it out or even suggest so this i feel is injustice to, to the patient years of treatment uh, you know the cost all this can just be overcome by the simple procedure myomectomy endometrial receptivity array now this is something which basically means that you know you are testing something which uh, says that suppose you're a day three transfer and then you should not transfer on day three you should transfer on day four or day two depending on the receptivity there's a lot of data you know which is uh, ambiguous about it i myself personally am not so convinced that uh, changing days is going to help but you know naturally uh, we have a large window of implantation women also, the cycle that you test may not replicate the cycle that you do your transfer. So many things. But there are, uh, you know, studies that are coming up that are saying that uh, after, a, uh, if you do it just after one failed attempt, in fact, it has led to a lower pregnancy rate. But if you are doing it, uh, after repeated attempts and also you're putting a genetically tested embryo normal uh, it is improving pregnancy rate so there is some discussion worth for error though personally I'm still not convinced about it uh, but of course I'm open to discussion and uh, we have facilities to do it then we come uh, to endometritis now this is something which is common in women common in Southeast Asia, treated very easily uh, with less cost and increases the pregnancy rate significantly. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, doxycycline, metronidazole, ornidazole, you have to treat both the partners, you have to treat it long term, sometimes repeated cycles. So, you know, uh, the, sick, uh, the main hallmark of chronic endometritis is when you take the tissues out, you see plasma cells. And uh, then in the hysteroscopy, it can be little red. There can be small micro polyps. And uh, you can even give uh, intrauterine flushing with antibiotics and doxycycline we have mentioned. This is how it looks on the hysteroscope. And this is how the cells look, the plasma cells. 
Of course, this is basic. Your thyroid should be as tightly controlled as possible. And it has shown that, you know, it improves your results. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, progesterone levels, they say blood progesterone, it does not correlate with uterine progesterone. And, uh, but uh, 10 to 20 nanograms is what uh, is, uh, you know, before embryo transfer, if it's too high, you don't transfer. Sometimes with, we usually go with history. If there is, you know, shorter cycles, if it's a fresh embryo transfer, if the patient gives history of bleeding before we, you know, uh, before the pregnancy test in previous cycles, we will add injectable progesterone. Now, why we don't add injectable progesterone in all? Because one, now some studies have shown that too much of progesterone is not good. It increases miscarriages. Number two, it's the most painful part of IVF treatment. Nothing else is painful, in my opinion. And, you know, you are just giving pain and so much of progesterone to a woman. So you need to individualize it. Uh, there are studies that have said oral didrogesterone might reduce pregnant, you know, miscarriage rate. So, uh, so again, you know, uh, serum levels may not correlate. There are so many confounding factors, age, weight, uh, time. Uh, so it's a bit of a gray area when to measure, what to measure. But I would uh, stick to clinical uh, features, criteria, and then do the uh, progesterone, give injectable progesterone. This is the study, the Midron study, which said that vaginal and uh, didrogesterone uh, reduces miscarriage rate. Now, this is a whole lot of testing, which says that these tests don't help. Uh, vitamin D, microbiome, NK cell, T lymphocyte cell, HLA, mtDNA, sperm DNA fragmentation they don't improve your recurrent implantation failure tests. So here, most of the tests I don't do. I don't believe in blood testing for NK and HLA and CD and all that. But what we have been doing in our center is intravenous immunoglobulin. And uh, I'll come to that when we go into the intervention. These are the investigations. So that's it for now, really. And uh, so it's very challenging when a couple comes with various failures, either at our center or coming from outside. And you have to really put your mind into it to decide what we can do to improve the results. Till then, bye. And we will meet you next time with the treatment for RIF according to the recent ESHRAE European guidelines. Thank you.